All right, all right. So, episode 28. Uh, this is a Whistler painting. And really what I want to share with you in this painting is how Whistler laid out his design uh, in a very, very elegant way. And elegant meaning long and slender, uh, specifically in this piece. The man is like the cane that he's holding. And when I looked at this piece, I loved the energy of it, the quiet sleekness of it. I also totally uh, in love with that little little white thing in his head, and his little white hair. Um, I remember back in the day when I, I think it was maybe eighth, ninth grade, we had a social studies teacher. And man, I fell in uh, infatuation with her. She had this beautiful dark hair, but she had this um, yellow streak. Uh, and it wasn't uh, accident. I mean, it wasn't like, um, uh, you know, dyed or anything. It just, her hair just had this yellow streak in it. And uh, man, I just thought it was the coolest thing. So I always think it's neat when, when people have, uh, you know, a little discoloration in their hair. Now, this guy kind of reminds me of my dad a little bit. Um, because sometimes when my dad comes out from working with the pigeons, because he's a uh, he does real estate, but in the morning he likes to spend time with his animals, and his animals are birds, and so he's like a bird farmer. And uh, and sometimes when he would come back into the house from the pigeon barn or the coops, uh, he had feathers in his hair, so <laughs> it kind of looks like a little bird feather sitting on his head, but. Um, and then, you know, he'd go take a shower and get in his little, uh, we, we like to call it the mafia, his mafia clothes, you know, his little suit and tie and everything. He'd look all like like a little mafia man when he go off to work. But uh, <laughs> but before he, before he cleaned up, he got pigeon feathers up in his head. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, so let's take a look at this this design here. Episode 28 of the Core 80. Now this is the thrust map, and we can see that if we look for our vertical thrust, it's obviously down where his foot is, and, um, and it shoots up to the top of his head through the highest point of contrast, which is really that little white feather. Bling! A little white feather there. Uh, not feather, the little white hair in his head. And this dominant curve is beautiful. It, you know, it curves around the side of his, the back of his head, through his chest, his hip, down through his leg. And just this elegant, you know, visual ride down, down him. Um, the dominant diagonal would be where his cane is. The dominant horizontal would be there in the background uh, where the wall meets the, the, the floor. Very simple. But I like how everything is compacted and also most of it all comes down and, and it you know, extends from that toe, that, that, that foot that's being pushed forward, that's leaning forward. It's pretty cool. So if we take the diagonal of the cane, what happens is it, it, it shoots us up, but it doesn't put us in the, in the, in the corner, okay? It doesn't put us in the corner. It puts us near the corner, but not in the corner. And so, but we know that's the dominant diagonal. So if that's the dominant diagonal, we know it, it's a very important diagonal in the composition. And so we can bet on that if we extend that diagonal, it's going to end up giving us a major um, information. So as we extend it down, down at the bottom and it hits the bottom uh, of the painting and then we shoot it straight up, bam, look at it, right through the center of that leg, up through the guy, basically where his backbone would be almost, right? Um, and then right up through the back of his neck, his ear, straight up to the top. You can even see like the writing 
in there a little bit. It's kind of fit inside that, that little space. So now we have this beautiful sinister, which is um, where the, uh, the cane is on. And if we flip it and, gives, and we get the Baroque, the, the Baroque equivalent of that, now we start to see like his hand is uh, being formed in there. It's coming up through his shoulder, the back of his head, or very close to it. And then it comes back down and gives us this other vertical on the left-hand side. So that is the rectangle and the two diagonals that ultimately will compose 80 to 90% of this piece, if not more. So if we take it and we double it, Okay, we take it, duplicate it, and, and move it over so that it butts right up against the left edge of the painting. We, we see what happens. We can see that his arm is starting to form, like the wrist area, his hand is starting to form in there. Okay, it gives us his back, this, this, this vertical here. It gives us the back of his foot the back of his uh, clothes, uh, his um, jacket. So it gives us some pretty nice information. Now what's beautiful is if we take this little motif, which is a simple rectangle with these two diagonals, and then we duplicate it, and it gives us this little triangle in the center, and we push it all the way across. All of a sudden you start seeing everything is locked into it. Boom, you see that? We have the cane, his, the, the, the back of his leg. Look at his, the shoes, his leg, the bottom of his garment locked into that, that matrix. Coming up through, his arms are locked into that matrix. And like right here is his shoulder. It's not locked in, but it mimics the matrix, that diagonal. Uh, where his collar or the back of his neck, parts of his face, um, all mimicking and pulling from the diagonal. It's beautiful. Now, if we take that shape that we looked at earlier, and we do a reciprocal, which is basically taking this portrait, this vertical rectangle, and flipping it so it's a horizontal one, and then shrinking it down, Okay, so it fits with inside the, uh, the full rectangle. So the relationship here is that it's the reciprocal because it's pivoted 90 degrees, and the other part of the relationship is that it extends all the way across the width of the painting, just like the original um, rectangle with the lines in it extends all the way across the painting, but vertically, okay, the, the height of the painting. So that's how we get the reciprocal. Now, if we take that and we multiply it down, it gives us a very beautiful, elegant design. And again, we get to begin to see how so many parts of this figure are locked in. Even the background, look at, look at the background. You see how that horizontal comes, but it doesn't go straight across. It like goes down on an angle and then across again. Bam, right there it is. It's, I mean, you can say, well, this was done intuitively. It, after you look at enough pieces and you realize that um, there's just way too many coincidences that are, are, are occurring, not just in this guy's piece not in this just in this piece but in all his work and then you start to see that this coinc these coincidences are occurring in other artists throughout different times throughout different subjects and uh and that's what they did you know back in these days the word drawing because um whistler studied in france in the uh in Gailey's, uh um well, it was originally De La Roche's studio, and then De La Roche passed the studio on to Gailey, and, and, and Whistler was one of the students there. And Renoir and Monet were students in that, gallery, I mean, in that studio as well. 
Um, also, people like Jerome and Brog were part of that studio, but they, they were there when De La Roche was, and when Gailey came along, that's kind of when the Impressionists started coming out of that studio. Um, but so these guys were all trained. That's what they were doing. They were, they were designing. That was, you know, that's what the word drawing meant. It was, just, it was synonymous. Design and drawing were the same words. So, oops. So this is, uh, I just wanted to show you this really beautiful, like how he got this elegant, long, elegant vibe, you know? And if that's what you want in your portraits, if you're doing portraits of people and you want a long, ele elegant vibe, look at how Whistler did it. So it's not about drawing the form of the person. It's about the design because... The design is the math behind it. It's the calculations that go into triggering within us, the viewer, the feeling of elegance. Now, could it be elegant if it was squatty? No. It, would, it could be graceful and beautiful, but it wouldn't be elegant. Elegant is a long line. It's sleek. And that's what he has here, both horizontally and vertically. So think about the spacing and the angles that your artwork is composed with. And, and, and I say that knowing that most people don't even do any of this stuff. I've seen uh, one artist doing it, um, Damien Chavez, uh, I saw him actually gritting out one of his pieces, very similar to this, where he had these beautiful um, diagonals. And, um, and his work is very, very well composed. Check him out, Damien Chavez, um, one of my favorite living artists today. Beautiful work. All right, cool. So um, here is the book that we uh, launched this, uh, earlier this week. Uh, the Public Guide to Reading Art, uh, Volume One. Uh, so there's uh, over 20 images, I think, in this in this in, in this book. Um, you know, and I'll go through and I and I show you the images. I, I write a little design note, giving you basically uh, a sentence or two, an over overview of what's going on in these images. Uh, at the top right hand corner, it's a PDF. So if you click on the link itself, click it'll actually take you to the YouTube video uh, that corresponds with the, um, with the design note and, and the artwork. And so here's the Norman Rockwell one, which was really uh, successful, and the Van Gogh one, which was brilliant, and lots of people love this one. So again, if you wanna watch the video, you can click there, bam, uh, and you can take a look. Like with the Van Gogh one, I show all, I think it's eight slides, so you'll be able to see all the slides um, and in a little book format. And so it's just a different way of consuming it. I do sell this one for seven bucks. So if you'd like to, uh, if you like the show and you've been getting a lot of value out of it and you want to contribute to kind of uh, help, you know, keep these uh, videos coming, uh, go ahead and go to books.core80.com and you can for seven bucks buy that uh, PDF and, and again, get access to the videos and, and the slides and all that stuff. So uh, you can go ahead and get over there. So, all right, cool. That was a, that was a good video. And uh, episode 28, done in the books. See you next time. Ciao.